I'm an ecologist, uh, mostly a coral reef ecologist. I, I started out in Chesapeake Bay and went diving in the winter and became a tropical ecologist overnight. And, and, and it, was really, it was really a lot of fun for about ten years. I mean, somebody pays you to go around and travel and look at some of the most beautiful places on the planet, and, and, and that was what I did. And I ended up in Jamaica, in the West Indies, where the coral reefs were really among the most extraordinary structurally that I ever saw in my life. And this picture here, it's really interesting. It shows two things. First of all, it's in black and white because the water was so clear and you could see so far and film was so slow in the 1960s and early 70s, you took pictures in black and white. The other thing it shows you is that although there's this beautiful forest of coral, there are no fish in that picture. Those reefs at um, Discovery Bay, Jamaica were the most studied coral reefs in the world for 20 years. We were the best and the brightest. People came to study our reefs from Australia, which is sort of funny because now we go to theirs. And, and, and the view of scientists about how coral reefs work how they ought to be was based on these reefs without any fish. Um, then in 1980, there was a hurricane, Hurricane Allen. Um, I put half the lab up in my house. The wind blew very strong. The waves were uh, 25 uh, to 50 feet high, and the reefs disappeared, and new islands formed, and we thought, well, we're real smart. We know that hurricanes have always happened in the past. And we published a paper in Science the first time that anybody ever described uh, the destruction on a coral reef by a, a major hurricane. And we predicted what would happen, and we got it all wrong. And the reason was because of overfishing and the fact that the last common grazer, a sea urchin, died. And within a few months of after that sea urchin dying, the seaweed started to grow, and that is the same reef. And that's the same reef 15 years ago. That's the same reef today. The coral reefs of the north coast of Jamaica have a few percent live coral cover and a lot of seaweed and slime. And that's more or less the story of the coral reefs of the Caribbean and increasingly, tragically, uh, the coral reefs worldwide. Now, that's my little depressing story. All of us in our 60s and 70s have comparable depressing stories. There are tens of thousands of those stories out there. And it's really hard to conjure up much of a sense of well-being because it just keeps getting worse. And the reason it keeps getting worse is that after a natural catastrophe, like a uh, hurricane, um, it used to be that there was some kind of successional sequence of recovery but what's going on now is that overfishing and pollution and climate change are all interacting in a way that prevents that. And, and so I'm going to sort of go through and talk about those three um, kinds of things. We hear a lot about the collapse of cod. It's difficult to imagine that two or some historians would say three world wars were fought during the colonial era for the control of cod. Cod fed most of the people of Western Europe. It fed the slaves brought uh, to the Antilles. Uh, the song Jamaica Farewell, Aki Rice Salt Fish Are Nice, is a, an emblem of the importance of salt cod from northeastern Canada. It all collapsed in the 80s and the 90s. 35,000 people lost their jobs. And that was the beginning of a kind of serial depletion from bigger and tastier species to smaller and not so tasty species, from species that were near to home to species that were all around the world um, and, and, and what have you. It's a little hard to understand that because you can go to uh, a Costco in the United States and buy cheap fish. You ought to read the label to find out where it came from, but it's still cheap and, and everybody thinks it's okay. 
And it's hard to communicate this. And so one way that I think is really interesting is to talk about sport fish. Because people like to go out and catch fish. It's one of those things. This picture here shows the trophy fish, the biggest fish caught by people who pay a lot of money to get on a boat, go to a place off of Key West in Florida, drink a lot of beer, throw a lot of hooks and lines into the water, come back with the biggest and the best fish. And the champion trophy fish are put on this board where people take a picture. And this guy is obviously really excited about that fish. Well, that's what it's like now, but this is what it was like in the 1950s from the same boat, in the same place, on the same board, on the same dock. And the trophy fish were so big that you couldn't put any of those small fish up on it. And the average size trophy fish weighed 250 to 300 pounds. Goliath grouper. And if you wanted to go out and kill something, you could pretty much count on being able to catch one of those fish. And they tasted really good. And people paid less in $1950 to catch that than what people pay now to catch those, those little tiny fish. Um, and that's everywhere. It's not just the fish, though, that are disappearing. Um, industrial fishing uses big stuff, big machinery. We use nets that are 20 miles long. We use long lines that have 1 million or 2 million hooks. And we trawl, which means to take something the size of a tractor trailer truck that weighs thousands and thousands of pounds, put it on a big chain, and drag it across the seafloor to stir up the bottom and catch the fish. And, and think of it as being kind of the bulldozing of a city or of a forest because it, it, it clears it away. And the habitat destruction is unbelievable. This is a photograph, a typical photograph, of what the continental shelves of the world look like. You can see the rows in the bottom, the way you can see the rows in a field that has just been plowed to plant corn. What that was, was a forest of sponges and coral, which is a critical habitat for the development of fish. What it is now is mud. And um, the area of the ocean floor, that has been transformed from forest to level mud to parking lots is equivalent to the entire area of all the forests that have ever been cut down on all of the earth in the history of humanity. And we've managed to do that in the last 100 to 150 years. We uh, tend to think of oil spills and mercury and we hear a lot about plastic these days, and all that stuff is really disgusting. But what's really insidious is the biological pollution that happens because of the magnitude of the shifts that uh, it causes to entire ecosystems. And I'm going to just talk very briefly about two kinds of biological pollution. One is introduced species, and the other is what comes from nutrients. So this is the infamous Calerpa taxifolia, the so-called killer algae. A book was written about it. It's a bit of an embarrassment. It was accidentally released from the aquarium in Monaco. It was bred to be cold tolerant to have in people's aquaria. It's very pretty, and it has rapidly started to overgrow um, the, the once very rich biodiversity of the northwestern uh, Mediterranean. 